today a little bit later. We're a little bit out of sync, okay? But what I wanted to do today was to um, re review a little bit about uh, Fred's first search and, um, and just to make sure we understand the idea, okay? Um, last class, we, we, we talked about it. Just to review the basic Fred's first search procedure. What did we do? We have a queue of vertices that represent the things we haven't completely explored. What we're going to do is start from where we are. In general, pull a vertex, the next thing to do off the queue. Once we get it, what we're going to do is call a, a couple of what I will call bookkeeping routines. These I didn't talk about last time, but they're going to be important that enable us to do things on during the course of our search. Process vertex means, in this case, it's a subroutine that we can call that will do something on the vertex right at the time we start exploring it, after discovery, but before we explore it. And process edge is going to be an, a routine that we can call that will will do something when we actually go and check out an edge that explore, if they have an edge from X to Y, we're going to have a routine that we're going to call only once for each edge, and that's process edge. Okay? So what we're going to find is that to make our breadth first search do something interesting, we're going to want to parameterize it so we can do actions when we are visiting a vertex or, or, or um, visiting an edge. Any questions about it? So don't be surprised when I start to use those. What are we going to be doing? We start our vertex. Initially, we process it. Now it's processed. That's true. We're now going to look at all the outgoing edges. If we discover, visit a vertex that um, has not been processed, that has not been discovered, that's what this would be, then what would we do? If it had not been discovered, then we're going to enqueue it and mark it as discovered. Okay, meaning we've discovered a new vertex and that'll be work for us to do later. Any questions? And as you'll notice, the way I've parameterized my breadth first search, there is another routine I could call, which is process a vertex late. The first vertex, one I would call before I start traversing all the outgoing edges of the vertex that, that I discovered. The other would I could call after I've out visited outgoing edges. And sometimes that's used, it depends when I want to do that. Okay, and that will hopefully be clearer soon. Any questions? So just to summarize, here's a breadth first search. When we do a breadth first search, what actually happens? Just to make sure we understand what we're doing. We have to start from a vertex. Let's say vertex one. We visit the vertices in, you know, in order of, let's say we're going to visit them in numerical order to break time. We start out visiting this edge. This puts two on our queue of things to do. We now look at the other one. We visit five. Five gets put on our queue of things to do. We visit six. Six gets on our list of things to do, right? And now we've explored all the edges coming out of V. These edges mark discoveries. Okay, we discovered new vertices. Now that we finished processing the first vertex, what is the next thing we do? We take the next item off the queue, okay, and start to process it. Okay, from two, what edges do we discover? Two has an edge going to one, but that vertex had already been completely processed, right? So we don't care about that. That doesn't teach us anything new. We could go to three, and yes, three discovers something new. We could go to five, and five discovers someone who is, hasn't been completely processed, had already been discovered. Does everybody see that? Five is sitting on the queue of future work. So we don't get credit for discovering a new vertex, okay? 
even though this is the first time that we're walking across that edge. Everybody see that? Now what do we do? We're finished exploring vertex two. Let's cross it off and start exploring the next guy, which was vertex five. Yes, we finished two, now we look at five. Five's outgoing edges. Okay, two was already completely processed. Four looks interesting. That's a newly discovered thing, right? What other edges do we have? We have one. One had already been completely processed. We're not interested in that particularly, right? So what do we do? We discovered four. That got added to our list of things to do. Now what do we do? We now explore what comes out of six. Well, six only takes us back to, to one, and there's not much else to do, right? We now explore four, okay? And four has what edges? Well, actually, did we ever explore three? I guess three I never put on the queue, right? That was bad of me. So I should have had three on the queue. Okay, when we explored three, we would have discovered this edge. Okay? Any questions about that? I did a bad job of that. Does anyone want me to go and do the example again? Raise your hand if you want me to do the example again. If not, we'll say it's, it's, it's kind of clear. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So what is good, or what is the big deal about breadth first search? Okay, actually, so the thing that is going to make our breadth first search implementation useful are these routines that I was talking about for letting me do something once when I visit a vertex and once when I visit an edge. These are my ways that I can use my generic breadth first search routine to accomplish different tasks, okay? And sometimes there are interesting tasks you would want to accomplish. One thing you might want to do is to print out every vertex when you encounter it, okay? And this is now an example of that. If I just have um, process vertex was called with the vertex number when we, we did it, this simple version says process each vertex. We know that we will only print out this line once for each vertex because only at one point do we first start to process each one. Does everybody see that? And in this case, even though an edge may go, we visit edges both ways. Okay? The way that I arrange to call the process edge routine. We canonically visited it every time the first time we traversed an edge. So this guarantees we will print out each edge once and each vertex once. Any questions about that? If you want to print out the contents of the graph, that's one thing you can do. Any questions? That may still not seem very interesting. But there are other tricks that breadth first search can do that are interesting and are important. One thing that breadth first search can do that is very interesting is finding shortest paths in a graph. Why, so if we took a look at a graph like this, let's say that we have a graph, I'll just draw a graph like this. What is the shortest path from S to T? How many edges are, is it? Three. What is the longest simple path from S to T? One, two, three, four, five, I think, right? Suppose we want to find the smallest number of, of uh, uh, the shortest path from S to T is measured by the number of edges. My claim that is interesting is that the breadth first search tree, the set of edges that sort of mark our discoveries of vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's build the discovery here, tree that we would get for this. From vertex one, we would discover vertices two and three. Does everybody agree with that? Do we know now the shortest way to get from one to vertices one and two, and from one to two and one to three? Certainly, right? We can do it in one edge, right? Now, we now are going to explore our oldest one, vertex two. 
And what vertices can we discover from two? We can discover four and five. Does everybody agree with that? My claim is this tree now gives us the shortest path from one to four to five. Why is that? Because by that, sort of like an inductive kind of an idea here, right? By definition, when we explore a vertex, the first root vertice, we find everybody that's a distance of one from me. That's the basis case, right? The first time I'm discovered meant that I am reachable by somebody I knew the shortest path to, right? And I wasn't reachable earlier. That's kind of the idea here, right? If you think about it, we start by exploring all the vertices that are a distance of one away. What are all the vertices that are a distance two away from the root? Okay. We said one. From, okay, from one we explored two. From three, we discovered four, but four was already discovered, right? Three doesn't help us discover any new vertices, does it? Let's keep going. From four, what do we discover? We discovered five, but five was already discovered, right? The important thing was we discovered six. And this, the path in this tree of discovering represents the shortest path between the root and that discovered vertex. Any questions about it? Do people see why that is, OK? Or that that it is? Or is it important to know that it, know that it is, OK? The other question is to see why it actually is, OK? Basically, the shortest path tree, in terms of number of edges, it is going to be the tree of discovery from breadth first search. Any questions about that? How many people believe it? OK. How many don't people don't believe it? Accept it. OK. A couple people. OK. Any questions about it? So what is interesting, the first thing that breadth first search is good for is finding shortest paths in an undirected graph. This is a useful thing. What would the shortest path take in an unweighted graph? That's actually what it is. What would the shortest path in an unweighted graph be if we ignored the weights, let's say, on a road network? Let's think about that. What would be if we wanted to, if we found the shortest, if we took the road network of Long Island and we ignore the weights, we don't care about how far it is, and we now ran breadth first search on it till we discovered, went from Stony Brook to Manhattan, what would that path be? in the tree, yeah? Shortest number of turns, does everybody see that? You don't, it's the shortest number of times you leave a, a um, somebody, sort of something that you leave, a road segment, does everybody agree with that? Any questions about that? So that could be interesting, okay? Any questions? Now how can we find it? So the way that we can keep track of what was in the tree was that if we went back to our breadth first search implementation, something we probably didn't notice before. Let's go back to stuff. Do we keep track of the parent here? Actually, maybe in this breadth first implementation, no. Do we keep track? Of, ah, we keep track over here. Oh, oh, oh I know, of, of what was discovered. Do we keep track of who discovered us? Let's take a look at this. Yeah, uh, yes. Over here is the critical line. Okay? Whenever we discovered a new vertex, we also kept track of who was it, my parent. So when I discovered Y, when V discovered Y, I'm keeping track that says that the parent of Y is V. Okay? Your parent is the one that discovered you, okay? Unless you left out on the stoop, okay? When your parents walked outside, oh, I'll take, keep this baby, right? Any questions about it, okay? But by having this parent relation, we get a tree. How many times is each vertex discovered? Can a vertex be discovered many times? No, vertices are discovered once. So every node has one discoverer. 
except for which one? The root, right? So if you think about this, this gives you a tree of discovery. And this tree of discovery is very important. It's what we mean the branch search tree. And it enables us to implicitly keep track of who is, what is the shortest undirected path, shortest unweighted path. Any questions? Okay, let's go forward again. How can we reconstruct this path? Suppose, let's say, you really wanted to know the path, the fewest number of turns between here and New York. How could you actually do it using coherent relation? Look at the following recursive routine, and you'll see it's actually pretty simple. Suppose we want to find the shortest path after we've done the breadth first search tree, after we have this parent relation set up, from the starting end point to the ending point. Okay? What are we going to do? The basis case is if the starting point is the same as the ending point, right? Then we don't have any place to go, right? We already have our complete path, right? And essentially we're done. In general, what are we going to do? We're going to instead find what is the shortest path. If you want to find the shortest path from the start to the end, why don't we instead find the shortest path from the start to the parent of the end, right? Given the vertex number of the ending vertex on our path, the parent gives us the previous link in the chain. Does everybody see that? It reduces our problem of finding the, 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 the path from start to end to a smaller problem, right? It has one less edge in it, right? So look at this recursive routine. Find a path from the start to the parent of the end. Print that out and then print out the path, the last vertex on the path. This recursive routine will basically follow that chain of parent pointers, bop, 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 back, okay? And identify where the parents, what, what, what the path is in the tree. Any questions about that? Okay, question, yes. It will not, it will, this will only work if start is an ancestor of n, okay? So if, if I have a tree that looks like this, let's come back here for a second. If I have a tree that looks like this, and this was start, and this was end, I would be in big trouble, right? Now note that breadth first search, that's an important point for some reason. It's only going to work if the start vertex is an ancestor in the tree of the end vertex. That's the critical point here, right? What that sort of says, there's a subtlety then, is that this tree of discovery gives you the shortest path from the root to everybody. It doesn't help at all to find the shortest path from somebody who is not the root to anybody. Does everybody see that? Any questions? How would you find the shortest path from vertex x to y if x wasn't the root of your previous breadth first search? How would you find the shortest path from x yeah? to another breadth first search from x? That's sort of what we're saying here. The breadth first search finds the shortest path to everybody radiating out from you, right? Like if I want to find where are you, who are the students closest to me, what would I do? Kachung, kachung, I'd discover you two students, right? And you would probably discover that guy, and that guy would discover that guy and that guy, because you're sort of neighbors radiating out. Does everybody see that? But that wouldn't help you find the shortest path from you to her, okay? Any questions? Okay. Any questions? Okay, so all this is a little bit technical. Let me tell you about a, let's say, important thing about graphs to recognize. That recognizing 
um, that, that sounds like a trivial problem, okay? But turns out to be amazingly useful in application. Let's say that here I have a graph, okay? How many pieces are there in that graph? If you look at it, how many vertices are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten vertices. How many edges? Probably shouldn't count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen edges. How many pieces are there? Two. Does everybody agree that there's two pieces? Okay. How could I make the two pieces into one piece? They had an edge between them, right? The chunk, one piece. Does everybody see that? A piece of a graph is called a connected component, okay? And certain graphs are naturally in one connected component. Sometimes graphs are in multiple pieces by design, where the multiple pieces have meaning. Let's think about it. The friendship graph of the world. Do we think that that work graph is connected? A graph is connected if, there, if it is all in one piece. Is the friendship graph connected? Who here says yes? Some people says no. Okay. Well, again, I don't completely know. But what would we sort of expect it to be? Certainly if there existed hermits, people with no friends, right? Those would represent separate little components here, right? Do we think the, the, the subgraph of all the people who are students at Stony Brook, do we think that friendship graph is connected? Uh, okay, yeah. Likely, I think probably, I'd like to think so, right? That somehow that, that everybody has a friend, but it's not enough for there to be everybody be a friend, right? Suppose, let's say, we lived in a world where all the, the male students there were no friendships between men and women, right? What would the, the friendship graph look like then? It would be two components, right? Everybody see that? So for certain graphs, components make meaning, have meaning, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? So one thing that is a surprisingly simple yet fundament, uh, fundamental problem is testing whether a graph is connected, okay? Any questions about it? It may seem like an easy enough problem. You don't recognize the applications. It's amazing how often, in the course of me talking to people about graphs, they will have some complicated sounding problem. Yet all that they really want to know about, really, is, is their graph connected? Okay, when you actually sit down and talk to them about their problem. One interesting example here, for example, of, of something complicated that reduces the graph connectivity. Has everybody seen a Rubik's Cube? Okay, remember you used to have Rubik's Cubes, they had these things, you would, you know, you had uh, a cube, there were nine tiles on a side, and you turned them to get all the colors lined up. Does everybody see that? Now, one question you might ask is, if I give you a Rubik's Cube, any possible way, configuration of a Rubik's Cube, can you solve it? Okay. How does connecting, thinking about Rubik's Cubes and solving Rubik's Cubes reduce to a graph? What are the vertices of the Rubik's Cube graph? Any idea? Well, it depends how you think of it. Colors. Colors would be what? There are probably a couple different ways you can think about the Rubik's Cube graph. The way that, I, that turns out to be interesting is to have a vertex for each possible configuration, meaning a coloring, a, a state of the puzzle. Here you've got a green, here you've got a black, whatever it is. Okay? Where every possible cube state okay, represented a vertex of the cube. Uh, a vertex of our graph. What would be a natural edge in this representation? Whenever you go to the cube, 
you move it from one configuration to the other, to another. Does everybody agree with that? You get a different Rubik's Cube state when you turn the dial, right? What then is the problem of solving a Rubik's Cube? Let's think about this. OK? Do people know what I mean by this graph? How many people are completely confused? Raise your hand. Somewhat confused. Raise your hand. Following me. What then is the idea of how you would you, if I gave you this graph, how would you solve a Rubik's Cube puzzle? OK? Yeah? Using an algorithm. But what does it mean, an algorithm we have in here? We have lots of algorithms, OK? What algorithm would we use? Does everybody agree that there's a perfect, fine, solved Rubik's Cube here? Well, this doesn't look shiny, because that's the right answer, right? If this was a Rubik's Cube, if that was a vertex in our graph, and you wanted to solve a Rubik's Cube, you're given an initial state of the puzzle. That's here, right? Does everybody see that? How do you solve the Rubik's Cube? Conceptually, if you did a shortest path thing from here to the, the solved problem, right? You either could start your search from here until you find the solved problem, or equivalently from the solved problem until you find your current puzzle. Does everybody agree that what that's going to really do is tell you what is the shortest sequence of moves that you need to solve Rubik's Cube? Does everybody see that? How many people see that? Okay. And one question that might be interesting is, is it possible to solve every configuration? If I give you a cube with, with, you know, colored with the right numbers of tiles of each type, is it always possible to untangle this thing? That problem is exactly the same problem as asking, is this Rubik's Cube graph connected? Right? If it's connected, there's always a way to get back to the solid state. But if it's not connected, somewhere there's a component of unhappy Rubik's Cube states, okay? which no matter how you twist, there's no way to get back to the other one. Any questions about that? OK. So asking if a graph is in one piece is an important problem. And that's what we mean by connected components. Any questions? OK. So how could I find connected components using breadth-first search? Any ideas here? If I give you a graph that might be in it's in one big adjacency list, right? But you don't know which vertices are, are in which component. How do we find out which vertices are in which component? OK, somebody else. Yes? If I start from one vertex and I start walking, breadth-first search is guaranteed if I'm given an undirected graph. Breadth-first search is guaranteed to find me a tree visiting every single vertex in the graph, in the component. Does everybody see that? If there is no edge between any of these vertices and some other component, I can't, in the course of my search, find this, could I? But I could start from one vertex, do a walk, and any vertex I discover that vertex has to be in the same component as me. Does everybody see that? So how can I implement this to find connected components? This is my algorithm. I initialize a breadth-first search. For every vertex, I start with the ith, the first vertex. OK, eventually I'm going to go down to the last vertex. I'm going to start doing a breadth-first search from this vertex, OK? Every vertex that I encounter during my search is going to eventually be discovered and then completely processed. Does everybody agree with that? So next time I go through this loop, vertex 2 might have been discovered in the course of the traversal from vertex 1. I'm not going to worry about that. 
But every time I start a new search, I'm going to increment this variable C, which is going to give me the number of my components. How many components do I have? And what is the critical thing? The critical thing is that um, basically, if I print out, if, if, if I print out in my process vertex the name of the vertex that I encounter, what is the output from this program going to be? It's going to start out and say print component number one. It'll print out all the vertices it encounters during the course of that search, right? Then it will return from that breadth first search and come back and loop through until we find a vertex that was not discovered on the first search. We'll then use that as a route for a second traversal. Okay? Any questions? And that will find all the vertices in the next component. Any questions about it? So breadth first search, one of the things that is a good thing about this is I can find connected components in a graph. Any questions? And I believe for your homework, you have to write a program to do breadth for connected components, right? Okay, so this is something to look at. Any questions? Okay, good. What other problem, okay, can you solve with just breadth first search walking over a graph? One interesting property is that sometimes you want to color the vertices of a graph. Let's say we draw a graph here. Let's try this. OK? Suppose I give you a graph like this. I might want to ask myself to color the vertices of a graph with different colors so the edges span two vertices in different colors, OK? In this case, how many colors do I need to color this graph? Let's look at this. If I take a look at this thing, if I color this vertex as black, OK, and this vertex is black, and this vertex is black, and this vertex is black, and this vertex is green, and this vertex is green, do I have any edges spanning between two vertices of the same color? Or do all vertices span two vertices of a different color? Which is it? Different. Does everybody see that? Now, what if I have a graph generally with n vertices, and I want to color the vertices so that I know that every edge has two vertices of different colors, is touching vertices of different colors? Can anyone give me a way to do it? I give you an arbitrary graph with n vertices. If I want to ensure that all edges, no edge is monochromatic, meaning it's touching the same colors, how could I do it? What if I colored every vertex a different color? Would that solve my problem? OK, so certainly I could do Right? But the trouble is that I don't have six different colors, right? The interesting coloring, because I can clearly color every vertex a different color and then have this property of a monochromatic coloring, right? Uh, of all ed no edges being monochromatic. I could certainly do it by with n colors. The interesting thing is doing it with the fewest number of colors, right? What graph can I color with one color? Anyone can describe all the graphs that you can color with only one color? One vertex? No. One with no edges, right? So let's say the friendship graph at a hermit's convention. Okay, that's what it would look like, right? It would all be colored the same thing, no problem, right? But here we have an example of a graph where um, everything is being colored with two colors. Can anybody think of graphs as a property that um, naturally they end up having two colors? That there is a way to break the vertices up into two colors, such that you go always go from 
one color to the other color and never have an edge going from one color to itself. Are there any graphs that naturally break themselves up into this sort of two-class structure? Okay, yes. Binary trees, okay, why a binary tree? Let's think about that. You're saying a binary tree has a two-color scheme. What are the two colors? Well, white and black, but why is it two colors? Why? If I have a red node, how can I color my children? Black, right? And if I take their children, what color should I color? Am I ever going to run into a conflict? No, there's never going to be any conflict if I do that. Does everybody agree with that? Is there anything magical about binary trees? What if I have another, a ternary tree? Is this still, what color should I color this guy coming out of it? Black, okay. I claim it should be clear. In fact, with this kind of argument, any tree can be colored with two colors. Does everybody see that? Any graphs that naturally break into this two-color formalism? Let's think about it. Okay. Well, it turns out they come up a lot. What if we have a graph where, let's say we have on one side students, and another side we had courses. Okay. So here we have all the students at Stony Brook. And here we have all the classes at Stony Brook. And there is an edge when there's a student in a class. Does everybody agree that if the students are colored blue and the classes are colored red, every edge is going to be from a student to a class. It's got to be a two-colored graph. Does everybody see that? What other examples of, of two graphs can there be? Yes. So dating sites, again, the, 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 the sort of other cute example is suppose, let's say, we lived in a heterosexual world. Okay, I don't want to say whether that's an accurate model. It's not an accurate model. But let's say we lived in had a heterosexual world where we had men and women Okay. The had sex with graph would always be links between a man and a woman. Does everybody agree with that? So there are naturally sort of two colors of the vertices, and all edges would represent links going across that. Does everybody agree with that? So there are lots of graphs that have this property, that there is a natural two coloring to them. And this is an important enough thing that we call this kind of graph a bipartite graph. Bi means two, partite means part. Okay? Any questions about it? So my question for you now is, if I give you a graph, how would you tell me, show me, find a two coloring if one existed? Let's say that we were given this sort of, you know, uh, had sex with graph. Okay? How could we figure out who were the the, the, the men and who were the women, okay? Just from the structure of the graph. Any idea? Yes. Suppose, suppose we start from, just like we were doing the tree, we start from one vertex and start doing a breadth first search of it. We're going to discover some things. These are the edges, right? If we colored the, if we have a choice of red and blue, what color must the all the if we color the root blue, what color must all the uh, vertices we discover be? They have to be red. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. When we explore an edge coming out of here. We're going to discover some other new vertices, right? Everybody see this? These had better be blue. Does everybody see that? 
But what happens if there's other edges not being in the tree? Where could those edges go? Yes. Well, it's not a separate component. OK, right now, if we discover, when we process this thing, this is going to discover another vertex. It's not really a separate component. There's still a way of going there. Can there be other edges in the graph? Where might other edges go to? Could there be an edge from here to there? Is that possible in the graph still be bipartite? Certainly, right? Could there be an edge from here to here and have the graph be bipartite? No, does everybody see that that's verboten, right? Could there be an edge from here back to there on a breadth first search? This one's a little bit more subtle. Okay, could this happen? It doesn't look like it violates a color constraint, right? But could this happen in the course of a breadth first search? No, why? And this is the important point. This is a distance one from here, right? So what would have happened if that edge existed? It would have been a brother of this, these other guys, right? Does everybody see that? So what's kind of interesting is that in the course of a breadth first search, we're going to see some edges are going to discover new vertices, right? Some edges are going to visit previously discovered vertices. And they can't go to backwards, or else they would have been discovered. They could either visit brother edge and sister vertices, or they can visit vertices one level down. If they visit one level down, that's OK. If they visit somebody on the same level, that is not OK, as far as bipartiteness. Any questions? So how can we discover whether or not a vertex is, um, a, a graph is too colorable by part type? What are we going to do? We're going to build, a, do a traversal, OK? Where what we're going to do is we're going to start out coloring every vertex as uncolored. We're going to start doing a breadth first search. The first vertex we encounter is going to be white. We'll label it that and then do a breadth first search on it. What activity do we want to do during the course of our breadth first search? We're going to have to color all newly discovered vertices, right? And what if an edge goes to something that's not newly discovered? Check to make sure it's not going to cause any trouble. So we need to do something whenever we encounter a new vertex and a new edge. Whenever we process an edge, OK, we're going to ask ourselves if the color of, if we have an edge going from x to y, if the color of vertex x is the same as color of vertex y. This is bad, right? We have an edge between two vertices of the same color. Does everybody agree with that? If so, we'd better say this graph is not bipartite. Otherwise, we might as well color x to be a different color, the other color than the color y, the different color of x, right? It could have been uncolored at first. By definition, we colored y, OK? Basically, what we can do here is now we're going to color y to be the opposite color of x. So if, if color complement here, if color was white, it returns black. If color was black, it returns white. This way, if we discover a new vertex, we'll color it a different color. If we discover a vertex that's the same color as us, or if we visit, have an edge that goes to a color that's the same color of us, we know we've got problems. Any questions about that? That's what we mean by bipartite graph. Any questions here? Okay. 
So the, 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 the powerful thing about these kind of traversals is that it, it, um, the, these operations, process an edge or process a vertex, let us do lots of things, okay, in the you know, lots of graph oper uh, operations as we go by. Any questions? Okay. Let's get out of here. Okay. Let's try um, the new lesson. Plus, plus, plus. Okay. So here, let's get to the problem of the day. We've been talking about the idea of um, breadth-first search on a graph. My problem of the day had to do with something about how the edges break down in, in, in breadth-first search. And we've actually talked about some of this today. It says, prove that in the course of a breadth-first search on an undirected graph, every edge is either in the tree of discovery Okay, or it is a cross edge. Okay, okay, where a cross edge is an edge to somebody who is not an ancestor, okay, or a descendant of me. Okay, so let's think about it. In the course of a depth first search, we're going to go kabunk, kabunk, we did this. We, expl we explored this vertex, we discovered this and this. We explore this, we discover this and this. We explore this, we discover this and this. We explore this vertex. If it's an undirected graph, could we have had an edge going back to an ancestor? In the course of our depth first search, our breadth, our breadth first search? No, and why not? We talked about that. This one would have been a child, so this cannot happen, right? So it's a tree edge. It can't go back to an ancestor, OK? Can it, on the other hand, go? And we have edges that go to somebody who's neither an ancestor or a descendant of me. Look at this. Can this edge go to somebody who's an ancestor? This guy goes to another vertex. It's not an ancestor or a descendant of me. Does everybody see that? It can go to one of my brothers. It can go to one of um, my, uh, what would you call it? Brother's children. Those are what, nephews? OK. It can't go backwards, because if I discover a new edge and it goes back in the tray, that edge would have been discovered before that. Does everybody see that? So one thing that's interesting about a breadth first search is that it labels the edges of my tree in a kind of neat way. It restricts where the edges can the graph can be. It organizes them. And that's a powerful thing about the search. Any questions? Okay. Okay. The other idea form of graph traversal is something called depth first search. And on one level, depth first search is nothing different than breadth first search using a stack instead of a tray, a heap, a, a stack instead of a queue. OK? But it turns out that depth first search will organize the edges of, a, of, of the graph in a very, very neat way. Okay, that gives us the power to create lots of other algorithms. Okay, so what does a depth first search procedure look like? For breadth, for breadth first search, we stuck things on a queue, and we had to actually explicitly call in Q. One of the nice things about recursion is recursion naturally uses a stack to keep track of all the procedure calls that you do. And so what's interesting is that breadth for depth first search is going to be a recursive thing that doesn't need a separate data structure. Okay? What is our depth first search going to look like? We're going to do a depth first search starting from a vertex. Okay? 
starting from this vertex, the first thing we're going to do is say, OK, we have discovered this vertex we are asked to process. Start searching from. If we want, now we can process the vertex right after discovering it. This is that auxiliary routine that I can add to get into the guts of my traversal. In general, what am I now going to do? I'm now going to look at the adjacency list for vertex V and cruise through all the vertices that are adjacent to V. While that is not null, means that there is some vertex Y that is adjacent from V to Y. There is some edge VY that we have to traverse. Any questions? If Y had never been discovered, now we have discovered it, right? This is the first edge we have found to vertex Y. Again, we mark ourselves as a the discoverer of it. OK? We can now walk over this edge for the first time. That's process edge. And then once we have finished putting, discovering our new vertex, we're going to immediately make a recursive call and start traversing from that vertex. What does that mean? If we start a search from this vertex, we go and we discover somebody, let's say vertex 3. Our immediate goal is to stop processing 3 and look at stop processing 1, table that for a while, and start exploring from here. As soon as we explore it, we'll go look at the outgoing edge. Maybe we'll discover another vertex, 5. We look at all the outgoing edges from 5. And only once we've exhausted those will we go back to 3. That's sort of pushing it on a, a stack. A stack, remember, was a last in, first out, right? This was the first guy to process. As soon as we discover somebody else, we lose our attention and start working on the new guy, on the new guy, on the new guy. Any questions about that? So breadth first search has the property that it doesn't radiate out gently in the neighbors from me. When I discover somebody new, I immediately do a recursive traversal from that new vertex. Any questions? When will I resume working on vertex, uh, uh, let's say that vertex 1 discovered 3. I now made the call for y equals 3. When will I resume working on 1 again? When I have explored everything that is reachable from 3. Does everybody see that? That I'm basically going to say, stop what you're doing now and go do a search from here. When that search finishes, exploring everything it can find, then and only then will it come back to me. Do people see what that's doing? OK. Any questions about it? OK. And again, basically, there's two conditions under which I'm going to process an edge. One is if it was involved in discovery. The other is if it's the first time that I've actually walked over the edge that way or that way. And I claim that, uh, that, that this is something that you know, this condition will test for that. Any questions here? Okay, yes. Yes. Six. Right, so if six, let's say, was a dead end, at that point my search would go to five, right? And now I would explore any other outgoing edges. Maybe there was an edge from one to five, right? This is not a problem, right? I would go back to five and then explore all the other children of five. OK? Any questions about it? OK? Any questions? Let's look at an example. I think I have an example. OK? Let's look at this thing here. Here I've got a graph. What if I do a, 
depth for a search starting from one. What happens to the edges that I encounter? First, I go and discover two. Okay? Look, that's good. I'm now going to keep working from two. I'm going down the path. From two, I'm going to go and discover the next thing I discover is three. Now, breadth first search might have stopped and now look at five, but no, I discovered somebody new, right? Let me look at the outgoing edges from three. Well, one goes back to two, but I already did that one. That's not interesting. Another one goes and discovers four. Okay? From four now, I'm going to look out. What can I discover from four? Oh, look, I discovered five. From five, I explore the outgoing edges from five. One of them goes back to two. Does everybody see that? This is a big difference from breadth first search. In breadth first search, two would have been di discovered five, right? Here, five is discovering two. Any questions? From five, where else can I go? Oh, I can go back to one, okay? But that's already been discovered. I can go back to, they did two. I went back to four, were discovered to me. There's no place I can go from five anymore, is there, right? The fact that there's no place to go from here means that five is now finished. It's discovered and now completely processed. Does everybody see that? Where do I pick up my activity? I back up to my ancestor. My ancestor was four. Does four have anybody else for me to do? No. Four is completely finished. Back up to the guy that called me. That was three. Does three have anything for me to do? Three is completely finished. Back up to two. Two is completely finished. Back up to one. Oh, one has somebody else who hadn't been processed, right? And that's when I'm going to go and discover vertex six. Any questions about that? Okay. So depth first search is for proceeding in a wandering as far as I can. And when there's nothing for me to do, I back up a step. Okay, and look around. Is there anything for me to do? Back up a step. Until I keep backing up, bop, bop, bop to my ancestor. Any questions about that? Okay. This may not seem very interesting. If I look at your faces, it doesn't seem very interesting. Okay. But it gives you a lot of power. Okay. What's interesting about it? Well, there are a couple things we can do with depth first search that we couldn't do on with breadth first search. One thing that turns out to be interesting, which I didn't talk about here, is we can keep track of when we discovered, when we entered a vertex first, and when we exited it. Okay, I think we also have an uh, exit time. See? Exit time. If we look at, let's say, when we are processing these vertices, which vertex has an earlier entry time? Vertex 1 or vertex 2? Which vertex do we enter first for the first time? Vertex 1 or vertex 2? Everyone agrees vertex 1 is entered first, right? Which vertex do we exit first, never to come back to again? Is it vertex 1 or vertex 2? Two? 2, does everybody see that? The time when vertex 1 is somehow discovered and not completely processed nests, vertex 2 nests within that time. Does everybody see that? Because I started, once I discover, vertex 1 discovers vertex 2. Vertex 2 now wakes up and does its thing completely before I ever get back to finishing up vertex 1. <clears throat> does everybody see that? So one thing that's kind of neat is that these discoveries times, entry and exit times, <coughs> Describe a kind of nested, well-formed, you know, order on the vertices, okay? And that will turn out to be useful to know. We will be able to know by keeping track of the times things were, dis were discovered and when they were finished processed. We'll be able to know who was sort of a parent of, or ancestor of whom. Any questions? Let's think about it. <coughs> If I have two vertices, 
here and here, okay, which are not parents or ancestors. They're not, they're not ancestors, right? They're brothers. <coughs> the time that these guys existed, when they were alive, yet not processed, what properties do the time intervals of these two vertices have? Was there ever a moment when both two and six were alive simultaneously? Where they were both discovered yet not finished with? Does everybody see that those time intervals have to be disjoint, right? Because we sort of will finish up with vertex two before we back up to one and start to explore vertex six. Does everybody see that? So there is some subtlety here. But these starting and ending times tell us a lot about how these vertices relate to each other. That's why it's a good thing to keep track of them. It'll be a little more concrete in a minute. Any questions here? Okay. Good. So the key idea here of depth first search is that we get information about the organization of the graph. One thing that is interesting and that is going to prove important for certain algorithms is that if we give it an undirected graph, the first time we see every edge, either it is going to go be an edge of discovery. Those are edges of discovery. Or it's going to go back to an ancestor. Right? Does everybody see that two is the great-grandparent of five? Everybody see that? It goes to an ancestor. Is it possible there be an edge from five to six here, such that I'm going to somebody who's not my ancestor in a depth first search? Could it be possible if this was an undirected graph that the first time I see edge five, six, I go from five back to somebody who's not my ancestor. Could this have happened? You say no, why not? What would have happened? Because this guy wasn't discovered yet, right? This guy didn't exist. If there was an edge from five to six, six would have been five's child. Does everybody see that? So one thing that's neat about breadth first, depth first search, okay, and makes a lot of algorithms go, is that it organizes the edges in a very neat and precise way. Any questions? Okay. So do people search whenever you have a depth first search of a graph? Okay. If the graph is undirected, all the edges have the property that they are either tree edges or go back to an immediate ans go back to an ancestor. Okay? Any questions? Why can't we have a situation like this where we have a forward edge going when I explored this vertex, I go to somebody who's already finished, a descendant of mine. Why can't I have an edge like that? where the first time I walk over this edge goes from this guy to a descendant, the edge going down. If I was doing a depth first search, why couldn't this happen in an undirected graph? When would I have visited this edge first? Yes. Going up, I would have said, oh, look, discovery. Discovery, nothing interesting. Discovery, let's look at the outgoing edges, right? If it's an undirected graph, an edge from here to there is also an edge from there to there, right? The first time I would visit this is looking out at all my options before I back up, right? So there is no way that this could happen in an undirected graph, OK? Any questions? It would have looked like a back edge. Can I have a situation like this, a cross edge, where I go to somebody who's not my ancestor, like here? 
Could this have happened with an undirected graph? What would have happened if I, when would I have visited this edge for the first time if I was doing a graph first search? What would have happened? It would have looked like this, ka-chunk, 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 ooh. When I explore this thing, I just discovered somebody else, right? This vertex would have been marked down here because I would have discovered it when I explored this guy, right? Not when I explored that guy. Any questions? So the neat thing about that first search is that all the edges are either tree edges and back edges if I have an undirected graph. Any questions? One thing that makes these depth first search algorithms work is it is very easy to write a function to tell when you're processing an edge whether or not an edge, what category an edge falls into. Okay? Under what condition is an edge XY? A tree edge. That would mean what? that x discovered y, right? That's what a tree edge means. Meaning that if the parent of y is x, then edge xy is a tree edge. Does everybody see that? How can I tell whether an edge goes back to an ancestor? Let's think about it if I'm doing depth first search. How can I tell if something goes back to an ancestor? It means an ancestor is one that has been discovered, but I'm not finished with it yet, right? Does everybody see that? If we did a depth first search, bop, 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 bop. This vertex has the property of having been discovered, but not completely processed. Any questions? So that's what I'm saying here. <coughs> if a vertex is com discovered and not completely processed, <coughs> then edge x, y, must be a back edge. Any questions about that? So bottom line, again, we'll look at these other classifications when we get to directed graphs. But what the important thing to see here is that when I'm working with these traversals, <coughs> it's easy for me to tell what type of an edge it is and do different actions based on that. That's what my classification routine will enable me to do. Any questions? OK. So as we said here, the critical point in depth first search, if I have an undirected graph, every edge is either a tree edge or a back edge. Question. So what can we do with depth first search? One problem that is a reasonably current problem is suppose I give you a graph that is not a tree. How do you find a cycle in that graph? Okay. Here we have a graph, one, two, three, four, five. This graph has a cycle in it, doesn't it? How can you take a graph and print out if you have a cycle? Okay, That's a fairly elementary problem on a graph, right? Does a graph have a cycle in it? How do you find a cycle in a tree? Suppose the graph is a tree, how do you find the cycle in it? Well, if the graph is a tree, how do you find the cycle in it? You give it up because trees don't have cycles, right? But if you have more edges than that, graph's going to have cycles in it. How can you find the order of vertices on a cycle? Okay? Any ideas here? How can I use depth first search in principle to find out if I have a cycle? So what happens if I do a depth first search? What's my depth first search of this graph going to look like? I'm going to start from, let's say, vertex 1. Ka-chung, discover vertex 2, nothing else interesting. Go back to, to 1. Ka-chung, visit vertex 3. Ka-chung, visit vertex 5. 
Kachung. Maybe I'll go visit Vertex 6. Does everybody agree with that? Kachung. Visit Vertex 4. From Vertex 4, I go and visit edges, and I now look at the edge 4-1. I have found the back edge. Does everybody see that? What is interesting about my back edge? Does my back edge help me show that I have a cycle? What is my cycle in my graph? Okay, once I find my first back edge, what is the cycle? Okay, if I have a back edge that goes from y to x, my cycle is, since a back edge goes back to an ancestor, there had to be a path in the, in the graph, a path in, in fact, the, breadth first, the depth first search tray that went from x to y. Does everybody agree with that? The path from x to y in the discovery tray and that edge y to x together makes a cycle. Does everybody see that? So how can I find a cycle in a graph? It is as simple as looking at my process edge and saying the moment I process an edge that is not a back edge, that is a back edge, meaning it's not a tree edge. I have discovered an, a cycle. What is that cycle? Well, to print it out, I have to go back and find the path that goes in, from, from x to y, y to x. But that's in the tree of discovery by backing up from here. I can back up by the parent pointers to go back and figure out what is the path from here to there. That plus this new back edge, the moment I can detect the back edge, means I have found a cycle in a graph. Any questions about that? Do people see, the interest, important thing to see here is, by augmenting my depth first search, by simply doing something on a, my process edge, this is all I have to do to breadth first, depth first search so that I find the cycle by just taking the right action when I visit an edge. The first back edge I find, ding, 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 I have created, I have identified a cycle. Any questions? Yes. Why can't you use breadth first search for it? Let's think about this for a second. Could you use breadth first search to create a cycle, to find cycles? What would happen if we did a breadth first search? Yes? Well, let's think about it. The short answer is going to be what happens if we encounter a cycle in a breadth first search, right? The short answer is anything that, the first thing that is not a tree edge is going to mean we have a cycle. Does everybody agree with that? So the moment we now add something that is not a tree edge, the first non-discovery edge does mean we now have a cycle, right? But it's a little trickier, perhaps, to figure out where that cycle is, right? How could we find the cycle? Well, maybe if we're going back to somebody on a different level, it would be that the, the edge is going here back to the parent this guy going back to its parent, and this. Does everybody see that? So the bottom line is you could find cycles using breadth first search. But it's actually a trickier thing. Where exactly the cycle, remember the cycle's not necessarily like that. It might be going to a brother instead of going to a nephew. Okay, and that might make it more complicated. The neat thing about depth first search <clears throat> is that it will always go back to an ancestor, okay? And that makes it simpler. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about how we use depth first search to find a cycle? Okay. There are lots of other problems which reduce to depth first search in a clean and elegant way. That problem of finding a cycle, I don't know if you thought that was elegant or not. 
okay? But you sort of said, hey, I could have probably have done that with bread first time. What good is depth first time? What did you do for me lately? The truth is that there are a couple of more complicated algorithms, okay, that are very important that use depth first search in an interesting way. And let me just try to describe one of them. There is a problem of trying to find the weakest point in a network. Let's say you were a terrorist. You wanted to blow up something to disrupt the, terror, the telephone network, okay? What would, um, which one of these cities would you, which one of these switching stations would you want to blow up, okay? I think everyone's going to say the most interesting looking one is this one. What is interesting about that vertex? If you blow it up, this person can't call this person, right? You've disconnected the graph by blowing up this vertex, right? What did you do, on the other hand, if all you did was blow up this vertex? Well, anybody who was living there was probably unhappy, right? But everybody else could continue to make phone calls without any problem. Does everybody see that? There is something interesting about a weak point in the graph, a single point of failure that disconnects the network, okay? Does everybody see that that might be an interesting thing if you were studying network performance? Where are the weak points of failure? Any questions? What does a vertex like that, we call a vertex an articulation vertex, if its deletion disconnects the graph? What would, let's just think about these articulation vertices, they're kind of interesting. What would an articulation vertex mean in the friendship graph? We had a friendship graph, and there was a, vert, a person whose deletion would disconnect the graph. What property does that person have? What? It means that somehow they're sort of spanning two worlds a little bit, right? That somehow that you could imagine that uh, you know that 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 somehow that if you have a world of a, a clique of people here, all of whom are friends or are sort of talking to each other, and there's a clique of people here. If there is one person who has a contact in both worlds, shooting this person means there is no way for these people to communicate anymore. Does everybody agree with that? Somehow the bridging between communities is done by these bridges, these articulation vertices. Any questions? So here's a question for you. Give me an algorithm to tell me if there is a vertex whose deletion will disconnect the graph. I always like to start with a simple, clear, correct algorithm. What is an algorithm to test if there is a vertex whose deletion will disconnect the graph. How would we do it? Yeah? What if I take this vertex and delete it? And now I test if a graph is connected, right? How do I test if a graph is connected? Do breadth first search or depth first search on it, right? If I can reach everybody from here, it's connected, right? If on the other hand, this was the one that I deleted. What's going to happen? I'm going to do my search from here. And I'll say, Kachunk, I discovered him. Discovered him. Discovered him. Discovered him. Go back, back, back. Ah, oh, discovered him. Okay. Hey, but I couldn't get to these guys, right? The graph is disconnected. So how much time would it take using this algorithm to repeatedly delete each vertex from the graph? Okay? For each one of the n vertices in the graph, I am going to have to do a separate graph traversal. Does everybody agree with that? I'm going to delete it, traverse from somebody else, and then come back again. Right? Does everybody see that? How much time does it take to traverse a graph with n vertices and n and m edges? If I 
bed first search or depth first search for, on a graph with n vertices and m edges? How much time does it take? n plus m, right? I'm going to visit each vertex once. I'm going to visit each edge twice. So this gives me an n times n plus m algorithm, or order n times m. Does everybody agree with that? There is a slicker algorithm for doing this in linear time. You step red step first search, which I encourage you to look at in the book. And depending upon my, how I feel next class, I may go through it again. Any questions about that? Okay, thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.